Hello, everyone. This is Rob Pike back with Julie McAllen for part nine in the conclusion of the series, The Last Days, highlighting the old prophecies of the or the prophecies of the Old Testament prophets and what they said concerning the last days of Old Covenant Israel. Julie, one of the things that uh, I want to make sure we look at concerning the prophecies of this time is what the prophet Isaiah had to say concerning this. Where do you think would be a good place to start? Well, <laughs> might as well start at the beginning, right? Uh, so how about chapter two? That's early in the book. I'm going to read what Isaiah chapter two, two through four says in the English Standard Version. Uh, he wrote, it shall come to pass in the later days, in the latter days, that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be lifted up above the hills and all the nations shall flow to it. And many people shall come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he, that he may teach us his ways and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations and shall decide disputes for many peoples. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Did you notice the passage begins with, it shall come to pass in the latter days? This is speaking of the last days of old covenant Israel, isn't it, Rob? Yeah, we know that. The, the, the verse has been misunderstood as meaning that it would be sometime in the distant future. But let's look at why we know this is not the case. First of all, I'd like to point out... Uh, just what Adam Clark, a Bible commentator from well over 100 years ago, had to say concerning this passage. Would you read that for us, Julie? Sure. Yeah, I found it interesting how he tied um, two of these so-called, you know, minor prophets together. He quotes from a guy named David Kimchi, who was a Jewish uh, Bible commentator. And this is what he said re regarding um, Isaiah 2.2. Wherever the latter times are mentioned in Scripture... The days of the Messiah are always meant, says Kimchi on this place. And in regard to this place, nothing can be more clear and certain. And the mountain of the Lord's house, says the same author, is Mount Moriah, on which the temple was built. The prophet Micah, Micah 4, 1 through 4, has repeated this prophecy of the establishment of the kingdom of Christ and of its progress to universality and perfection. So that's from Adam Clark's commentary in the Bible. And you know, Adam Clark is correct in pointing to Micah's prophecy because it repeats much of the information stated here in Isaiah. And so it shows that not only has the word of the Lord gone out once concerning this, but twice by different prophets. So, you know, we have even more assurance as we showed last week from Isaiah 55, 11, that God's word never returns to him void. So we know that this prophecy was absolutely fulfilled. Yeah, without a doubt, Julie. <clears throat> In fact, all we have to do is look at history of the nation up to this point, and we know that it was uh, filled with constant violence and fighting. It was constantly having to battle uh, other nations mm -hmm. and has a history of continual loss and rebuilding through military efforts all the way up to the very end. In fact, at the very end of the nation, when it came under judgment as spoken of by the prophets, we know that the Jews, specifically the Zealots, actively and purposely did everything they could to fight a very bloody war with the Romans starting in AD 66, didn't they, Julie? Yeah, that's right. In fact, the in the final war, which was so precisely written about by the Jewish historian uh, Josephus, we see that the Jewish zealots did everything they could to get a formal declaration of war from the Romans to the point of actually setting fire to the houses of Ananias, the high priest, and to the palaces of Agrippa and Bernice. This was at the beginning of the war in AD 66. And, you know, many people think that this war was a totally one-sided war with, you know, the Romans just coming in and rolling over the Jews during this time. But that's not the case, was it, Rob? No, it isn't. In fact, uh, just recently, I watched a uh, uh, 
a video concerning this that was made by somebody that he he pointed out everything. I mean, these these Jews, the uh, <laughs> the wars of, in the wars of the Jews, written by Josephus. He even puts background information there concerning how the Maccabean revolt was a seven-year war against the Seleucid Empire, with the Maccabean Jews finally winning out as they fought valiantly against the armies of Antiochus Epiphanes. They thought they could do the same thing against the Romans, who were controlling the land in which were, they were living. And Josephus goes on to great lengths to show how they did fight proactively and mounted many direct assaults on the forces against them. But in the end, due to the absolute resolve on the part of Emperor Vespasian to destroy them and their city, they lost everything, including over a million Jews' lives. And we know that this time it was different because they were under judgment from God. As a result of this, they had no choice but to beat what was left of their swords into plowshares, so to speak, for the nation of Israel was actually no longer a nation. But this prophecy in Isaiah chapter 2 is speaking of much more than this, isn't it, Julie? Yeah, it is, Rob, because it speaks to the establishment of the kingdom of God. So, And, and, and that's not the same type of kingdom uh, that they were living under at that time, because uh, Jesus clarified that um, when he spoke with uh, Pilate, Pilate asked him if he was the king of the Jews, how did Jesus respond? He said, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews, but my kingdom is not from this world. That's from John 18, 36. And he further said of it, the kingdom of God is not coming in ways that can be observed, nor will they say, look, here it is or there, for behold, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you, Luke 17, 20 through 21. So, you know, this kingdom is is different. than yes, That's kingdom. right. And, and, you know, when we look at this prophecy from Isaiah, we must realize that it is primarily not a physical kingdom that Isaiah, Isaiah was speaking of here. In other words, it's not a kingdom that would be established just like other kingdoms with a king on the earth and all that sort of thing. Jesus established this kingdom while he was on earth. And it has been in existence all of this time, basically a spiritual kingdom. It does have physical components, but the main part of the kingdom of God is in heaven where it has been for nearly 2000 years, but it is also on earth in the body of believers. Jesus said in Matthew 13, 31 through 32, that it would be growing just as a mustard seed does from the smallest seed to the largest of all the plants in the garden. And it has been doing this all this time. This kingdom would grow without weapons of warfare, but through the spreading of the gospel throughout the earth. Now, if you take a big picture view, Julie, of all the things that are going on for the past 2,000 years, you can see the tremendous impact of this message since so much of the world is now considered to be Christian. Yeah, that's an important distinction. You know, the, the kingdom would grow without weapons of warfare. Uh, but through, you know, just this word, you know, spreading of the gospel. Yeah. And apart from the totally misguided crusades, you know, people are going to bring that up. So the crusades of the dark ages, that that was not representative of the message of Christ. Um, and so the kingdom message, it's been accomplished worldwide without the use of weapons. And I happen to know that because um, no one held a gun to my head when I received the gospel, right? right. <laughs> so I entered the kingdom without warfare. Um, I like what 18th century Bible commentator John Gill had to say about the passage in Isaiah 2, 2. He said, the days of the Messiah com commenced in the latter part of the Old Testament dispensation or Jewish world towards the close of their civil and church state at the end of which he was to come, uh, Habakkuk 2.3, and accordingly did, which is called the end of the world and the last days, that is, of the state, Hebrews 1.2, and ushered in the world to come, or gospel dispensation, which is properly the days of the Messiah, reading from his first to his second coming. You know, Gil mentioned um, Habakkuk and Hebrews in there to support his points. Um, Rob, you want to read those? Sure. Yeah, I, I really think we should. Uh, Habakkuk 2.3 says, 
For still the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end. It will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. That's Habakkuk 2.3. And then this is basically, uh, once again, a reiteration of Isaiah 55.11 that says his word will not return to him void. And the other scripture uh, properly sets a time for this event, and that's the one that he quoted in Hebrews 1.2 where it says, but in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed as the heir of all things through whom he created the world. Now it says here that the last days is when this happened. Yeah. <clears throat> we know that the book of Hebrews was written just a few years before the Roman siege, which resulted in the complete end of the old covenant. But the complete end of old covenant Israel also happened. Now, Julie, as we move through Isaiah's prophecy, looking at the prophecies in the last days of the Old Covenant, next we come to the fourth chapter, just as it says, and I'd like to read what it says in Isaiah 4.4, 4, where it says, when the Lord shall have washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion and cleansed the bloodstains of Jerusalem from its midst by a spirit of judgment and by a spirit of burning, it sure sounds like judgment to me, doesn't it to you? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, and uh, what's interesting is what uh, commentator Adam Clark had to say. He ties this passage together with the prophecies of several prophets in a very interesting way. He states, the spirit of burning means the fire of God's wrath by which he will prove and purify his people, gathering them into his furnace in order to separate the dross from the silver, the bad from the good, the severity of God's judgments, the fiery trial of his servants, Ezekiel 22, 18 through 22, has set forth at large after his manner with great boldness of imagery and force of expression. God threatens to gather them into the midst of Jerusalem as into the furnace to blow the fire upon them and to melt them. Malachi 3, 2 and 3 treats the same subject and represents the same event under the like images. But who may abide the day of his coming, and who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like the fire of the refiner, and the soap of the fullers. And he shall sit refining the purif and purifying the silver, and he shall purify the sons of Levi, and cleanse them like gold and like silver." You know, Rob, I've noticed this illustration of purifying metals before in the Bible. Um, it's used in, in a few other places, isn't it? Yeah, you know, I'm really glad you mentioned that because in both the Old and New Testaments, we see that our God states that he is a consuming fire. And this would be, uh, for example, a couple of passages would be he, uh, Deuteronomy 4.24 and Hebrews 12.29. The metallurgical terms like this are used often in the Bible, beginning with what was said in the Torah. Notice the following. It says in Numbers 31, 22 through 23, only the gold, the silver, the bronze, the iron, the tin, and the lead, and everything that can endure fire, you shall put through the fire, and it shall be clean, and it shall be purified with the water of purification. But all that cannot endure fire, you shall put through the water. So the use of fire for cleansing has been used, I've noticed, uh, and I, I did a little bit of research on this, over 70 times in the New Testament. Wow. <laughs> and I think that it's because it ties so well with what the Old, prophet, uh, the Old Testament prophets had to say. I really think we need to read that passage in Ezekiel too, because it, it still has some interesting things to say about what's going to happen to Jerusalem using these same metallurgical terms. Yeah, okay, I can read that uh, that passage from Ezekiel. Um, this is uh, chapter 22, 18 through 22, which was um, mentioned. It said, Son of man, the house of Israel has become dross to me. They are all bronze, tin, iron, and lead in the midst of a furnace. They have become dross from silver. 
Therefore, thus says the Lord God, because you have all become dross, therefore, behold, I will gather you into the midst of Jerusalem, as men gather silver, bronze, iron, lead, and tin into the midst of a furnace, to blow fire on it, to melt it. So I will gather you in my anger and in my fury, and I will leave you there and melt you. Yes, I will gather you and blow on you with the fire of my wrath, and you shall be melted in its mist. As silver is melted in the mist of a furnace, so shall you be melted in its mist. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have poured out my fury on you. Wow. <laughs> you can really see the Lord's fury on these people, uh, and that's for their extreme disobedience. Um, it's very direct. Right, Rob? Right. You know, I can really identify with this uh, uh, metallurgical term here because early in my career, many, many years ago, I used to uh, work on linotype machines, and the linotype machines had a, a metal pot of molten lead and I used to have to skim every day all that dross off the top of it. Wow. So I'd put okay. some stuff in there to help and just like they put sulfur in to do gold. I would put the stuff in there. It would smoke a little bit and then I'd skim the dross off. Matter of fact, I dropped some of it on my foot uh right where my sock line was and I still have a scar from that from years oh, ago. My goodness. Yeah. So so the people of that day had a very uh close image of that. They were used to that. Yes. And I'm sure they had too had many injuries that were re reminding them. Yeah, and and in this verse once again you see the simile of uh, the removing the dross from the precious metal. And we know from the strict principle of justice from the Torah that the punishment of God is two things. First of all, it's always corrective. And second, the principle has always been that the punishment must fit the crime. An eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. I mean, Julie, these people were sacrificing their children to the false god Molech. Can you imagine the screams of those children as their precious little bodies were thrown into that fire while still alive? I mean, this was so detestable to God that it was one of the major reasons for the first destruction of Jerusalem. But just to show the amazing grace of God during the prophet Jeremiah's lamentations of this event, we see the corrective, corrective uh, nature of God's punishment because it says two very important things in Lamentations 3. Would you read those verses for us? Yeah. You know, we know God's justice is always perfect, like you said. Um, and we can see that plainly in the um, five books of the law or the Tanakh. Uh, punishment is tough, but Jeremiah saw God's mercy and faithfulness. And that's important to look at. So I'll read that. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. A lot of people know that verse, Lamentations 3, 23, uh, 22 to 23. And later in the same chapter, he writes this, For the Lord will not cast off forever. But though he cause grief, he will have compassion according to the abundance of his steadfast love, for he does not afflict from his heart or grieve the children of men. Lamentations 3, 31 through 33. This definitely highlights God's love and compassion. He warns ahead of time, and each time God released his fury upon them, there was a way provided to escape. Yeah, that first verse that you read there, Lamentations 3, 22 through 23, we we know that verse from a, a, a famous hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness. And that's what that was taken from, Julie. Yeah. And, and we really, I really like that hymn. Yes, his compassion is always corrective in nature, just as you would naturally correct your own child and then you would be restored to them. And we know that this aspect of God's personality will never change because God has promised in Malachi 3, 6 that he will never change. Julie, I know we could probably go on for several more episodes to show the prophecy of the, of the Old Testament and how they predicted the end of Old Covenant Israel. But uh, with us now being on episode nine of this series and showing several of those prophecies in detail, I believe we've made our point. So now we're once again at the end of this series, and I'm sure that uh, we both want to, to end this series concerning the Old Testament prophets on a high note, don't we? 
Absolutely. <laughs> so in order that we would want to do that, such a thing, I, I think we would want to consider a wonderful passage of scripture, which gives us the entire basis for our hope in the, from the book of Isaiah. If you had to pick out one of those, which ones would you pick out? I know it's a loaded question, but. <laughs> well, since you asked me, and I suspect most people are familiar with this one. We hear it a lot of times at Christmas. Um, I'm going to read from the often quoted passage from Isaiah 9, uh, verses 6 and 7. Yes. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. That's it's cr really encouraging to know, Rob, that the Lord keeps his promises. He established his kingdom in the last days, as we've just shown, and we're living under that kingdom of God right now. And even though we do experience negative things here on earth, we know, as did the Apostle Paul, per Philippians 3.20, that our citizenship is in heaven, where we will go immediately in the twinkling of an eye when we pass from this physical body. That's right. Isn't that a wonderful hope, Julie? Amen. <laughs> When we will be given a new spiritual body, as it says, uh, to live the life of the ages. I'm really glad we did these, uh, this series, aren't you, Julie? So what, what's next for our viewers? Yeah, and, and thank you, Rob, so much for hosting these studies. They've been very edifying. Um, well, having discussed Rob or <laughs> Rob's Jesus's greatest prophecy, often called the Olivet Discourse, which we have looked at uh, from Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21, we will next consider the Apostle John's version of this. And what would that be, Rob? Yeah, of course, that would be the book of Revelation. And uh, But as we begin our next series, we will first do a little short review of Jesus' greatest prophecy, which is was highlighted in those chapters you just mentioned, Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21. And then we will uh, begin looking at the revelation given to John. And our focus will be on how we know that this prophecy given by inspiration to the Apostle John has also been fulfilled. Anything else, Julie? Revelation fulfilled? Yeah. Ooh, no doubt that's got some viewers curious. So <laughs> if uh, you've been enjoying this series, stay with us and we'll have another one for you next week. And um, we'll look into that. Uh, until then, enjoy his word and keep yourselves in God's love. Right. <clears throat> so until the next time, may God's grace be with you always. Have a great day. Bye-bye.